Voila. Okay, so now notice, if you will, um, we want to go back to the book of Daniel chapter 2. And let's look, if you will, in Daniel chapter 2. And what I want to do is start, uh, I'm going to start in verse uh, 31 again. And let's notice, thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. And we have been stuck there for a while, and that's okay. Um, I am more interested in making sure we understand. And those of you who have that book in front of you, you have that image of the, uh, of the uh, well, the, <laughs> the image of the image. Uh, you have that picture of the image. And this image represents the times of the Gentiles. We have uh, understood the beginning of it. We understand the significance of it. Now we're going to identify, and we've identified the Antichrist during this period of time, and we're also going to identify the end of that period of time, which is what we've been working on lately. Um, now notice, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, the form of it was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly, its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet part of iron and part of clay, that eastern, western part of, of uh, Rome, of course. Thou sawest until a stone was cut out without hands. Whenever you see without hands, uh, the stone without hands, uh, circumcision without hands, uh, you're usually talking about the person and work of Christ, which smote the image. What image? Well, it smites these empires and what these empires stand for in the world, the Gentile, the times of the Gentile. Um, uh, and smote the image upon its feet and that were of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. That's going to be the Roman Empire. That's res re resurrect. I guess I should, can't see, I have a re resurrection, can you? Resurrected during the time of uh, the tribulation by the Antichrist. Okay? Then were the iron and clay, bronze, silver, gold, broken to pieces together. So you, you see, uh, you, you're, you're seeing a judgment on the whole thing, the whole uh, representation of that image, the Gentile world power, the times of the Gentile and became like chaff of the threshing floor, and the wind carried them away. Whenever you see that idea of wind carrying away chaff, that's usually the judgment of God. That no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image, the times of the Gentiles, became a great mountain, became a great what? Kingdom, the greatness of the kingdom, as Daniel would tell you later, and filled the whole earth. Uh, that's what this kingdom's going to do. It's going to come and it's going to destroy the times of the Gentile. And it's going to fill the earth with the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now let's look in verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. You see, you're in that kingdom. That's why you need to know about this. You know, this business of, oh, prophecy is too hard. I can't understand it. Well, uh, you're, then you're, you're denying about, oh, a good, almost over half the book of, of, of the Bible. <laughs> so I would suggest you spend time understanding it, okay? Now, people get lazy when it comes to this, and they add in theatrical and dramatic interpretations. They spiritualize other things, and you don't get a good interpretation. Uh, understand what prophecy is, and we'll go over that today in a minute. Which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces, consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, it's pretty clear what Jesus Christ is going to do, isn't it? When he comes to the earth the second time, we call that the second advent, right here. This is the second advent after the tribulation period of time. Okay, he's going to touch down on the Mount of Olivet, east of Jerusalem. It will cleave in half. And then there will be that great battle, which we're going to look at together eventually. 
For as much as thou sawest, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. And that's that reiteration, without hands, not the hands of men. This is the, is the kingdom from where? Heaven, the kingdom of heaven. And that's that same kingdom that Jesus Christ preaches about in the book of Matthew. Um, and it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. Oh, remember that word? The things hereafter. Does that sound familiar? Revelation. Revelation. Exactly. Okay. And the dream is certain and the interpretation of it is? Why? Okay, God does it and said it. Why else? You're, you're getting close. That's right. It's God given interpretation. It's set and it's going to happen. Okay, that's a good definition. Uh, it's already done. Yeah. There's no time with God. Uh, remember this statement. Then he justified, no more, no less. Then he also glorified. done. Yeah. Uh, blessed be the God and Father who hath given us all the spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. Has been done. Yeah. So understand, you see, that's what that this I want you to I want you to get this because they that worship God or for worship's sake, one. They that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? That means that there's no physical limitation. Time is a physical limitation. God's not under time constraint. He's the ancient of days. I love it when people say the Bible's outdated. No, you're outdated from the Bible. Okay. You can't outdate an infinite God and his word. I mean, how stupid is that? The word of God's way ahead of man. <laughs> it's man that needs to catch up <laughs> or repent or be saved. Uh, God and his word isn't the problem. Okay? So understand, and, we, and we, we see that in Daniel, the ancient of days comes and brings his kingdom in. Okay? So when we're getting this word, we're getting it from the ancient of days. Now, what is prophecy. Look in the book of Revelation chapter 19. What we have today people calling prophecy is basically fortune telling. And uh, watch out when you get a guy behind a plastic pulpit making money through TBN and he's telling you, oh, I have this special prophecy. You got to come to me to get it. God just gave it to me. Now send your money. Um, you know, get my book. You know, I love that. Uh, yeah, you go ahead and do that. It's a big fat waste of your time um, it's prophecy and its parameters what it has to do with is defined in scripture and in revelation chapter 19 verse 10 and i fell at his feet to worship him and he said unto me see thou do it not this is the angel that is moving with john to write these things down um, i am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now when you get that verb is, and notice it's in present tense. It's not will be. Is. Everything is ever present with God. This prophecy is, is concerning Jesus Christ and his kingdom. That's what it has to do with. Okay? So when you get something in a newspaper, so-and-so is making this prediction about the future, um, that's a waste of time. You'd just be uh, miss, miss. And how many times have they missed it? You know, I mean, that should do it for you uh, in and of itself, right? Uh, these guys miss it all the time. Why would you uh, even think about uh, following somebody who, you know, is it's like a weatherman, isn't it? <laughs> Especially in the state of Ohio. <laughs> Especially lately, it's been frustrating. Uh, I had to say it. Okay, so 
Uh, that's what the prophecy is talking about. It does not come by the will of men. It's holy men who are moved along by the Holy Spirit. So it's about Jesus Christ and his kingdom. It's not about getting rich. It's not about any of that. Okay, so we know that. All right, now, um, what I'd like to do is express to you what this Armageddon is. So let's, uh, let's kind of forget about, for a minute, um, let's kind of forget about what um, Hollywood would have us uh, think about, and let's, re let's look at what the scriptures have to say. This is God's defense of Jerusalem and the ending of the times of the Gentiles. That's what Armageddon is. Does everybody understand that? And we're going to get, we're going to go all the way back. That's right. We're going to go all the way back and follow it all the way forward as to this place of Megiddo. Okay. Overall, throughout the Bible, it is a strategical location in Jezreel. And if you remember, a lot of things happened in Jezreel. Remember Ahab and Jezebel were taken care of there in Jezreel. Um, uh, and so it's, it has always been a place of military strategy. Okay, it's a strategical location. So let's first turn for a minute uh, to the book of Revelation chapter 19. The book of Revelation. Why are we taking time to do this? We want to identify what the end of the Gentile world power, what that's going to look like. And remember that this is literal. It's going to be a gathering of these nations. And we saw that there's a horn that comes up and replaces three horns out of the ten horns. And those are a confederacy of, a confederacy of nations instigated and influenced by who? The Antichrist, the little horn of Daniel. Uh, the time of abomination, um, as Jesus Christ points toward Daniel and Matthew, uh, the willful king um, of Thessalonians, the beast that rises out of the waters, the sea of man, the Antichrist. Okay, so now let's look in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 19. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called, what's his name? Reliable and genuine. You can see those are two, these, those are two qualities that are going out the window these days, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I've just noticed, especially since the new normal, you can forget about service. Nobody's faithful. Uh, I, I, I have had people in the back of my car... And I had a manager of Wendy's once in the back of my car, and he was trying to go in at 5 in the morning. And I said, man, what happened to Wendy's at 9 or 1 in the morning? Of course, I can't go there at 1 in the morning anymore. Those days are over. But he said, can't get anybody work? So I said, let's close it. Well, I said, well, how are you supposed to know which Wendy's is open and which one isn't? Got to go find out. There's no fit, no reliability. No reliability. I think I saw a hamburger place once say, we'll give you a, uh, what do you call it when they, they want to hire you? Um, Incentive. Yeah. We'll pay you $100 to just sign on. Yeah. I thought, well, okay. You know, no, I won't. <laughs> uh, amazing to me. Yeah. We don't know what reliability is anymore, do we? But the one who comes, his names are reliable and genuine, faithful and true, the verily, verily, the truly, truly of God, the one who came in grace and truth. Now, his second advent, and we say advent like up here, advent is his coming to the earth, to the earth. That's an advent. Here at his birth, here to judge. The rapture is sometimes called as the second coming. But that is a meeting in the air for, uh, with, uh, for his saints. This will be coming to the earth with his saints. Okay? All right. 
and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Um, his eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the what? You know, it's funny. That's what we're apostatizing from today, even in churches. <laughs> the word of God is not center stage. Entertainment and everything else is center stage today, isn't it? But the word, the Logos, that came and tabernacled among men, took upon him human flesh. Um, the word, a fellowship that John talks about. The word, the Logos, the revealer of God. Uh, there'll be no getting, you can run, but you cannot hide from the word of God. <laughs> The word of God, Jesus Christ, and God's word, his written scripture, will have the last say. Okay? That's how it's going to be. All right. And the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. All this whiteness is righteousness. Very good. And out of his mouth goeth the what? A sharp sword. And it's kind of like fear. Either you fear God or you'll fear God. Uh, either you'll be under the sword or under the word or you'll be under the sword or under the word. <laughs> you know? It'd be good if you were under it now. Okay? It'd be better to be on board uh, now. And with it, he should what? He's going to smite the nations with the sword of his mouth. Uh, and he shall rule them with a what? And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. That's going to be the measure of destruction. I want to tell you, yes, God is love, and they uh, and, and manifested in the love of Christ is or in the love of God is what? That He is the propitiation for our sins. But I'll let you know something in case you don't think he is. Read the book of Revelations. You'll find wrath on almost every page. He's also a God of wrath. And he's going to make short work of sin. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Remember how they crowned him and mocked him. Right? Jesus of Nazareth. King of the Jews. Remember that? Mm -hmm. He's a whole lot more than that, my friends. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords universally. Mm -hmm. And his rule will last forever. A little bit of a switch. The second advent, isn't it? And I saw in heaven standing in the sun. I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together under the supper of the great God. Now this is rather gory. And when I think about this, and it's sarcasm, I think about how, you remember the first generation of Israel that wouldn't go into the land? And the description yeah. of them was their carcasses mm -hmm. were the... <laughs> That's pretty rude, isn't it? That's a, that's a pretty raw definition. But they rose up against God, didn't they? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't follow his promises. And their carcasses were left in the wilderness. That's just how it's described. Uh, and notice, um, and they may eat the flesh of kings, flesh of captains, flesh of mighty men, flesh of horses, of them that sit on them, the flesh of all men, both free and enslaved, both small and great. It's going to touch everybody. And I saw the beast. Who is that? Well, that's Revelation's picture of the Antichrist. He's described in chapter 13. I saw the beast and the king of the earth and their armies gathered together to do what? Make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. That's Satan's movement. That's the kingdom of darkness. 
Remember what the people say in chapter 13? Oh, who can make war with the beast? Well, you're going to find out. They're thoroughly convinced the beast is going to prevail. And they follow him. Right? And they bow down to the, what? Image and the false prophet. Right? All right, now notice. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles, so be careful if that's what your faith is based on, before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his... Mm -hmm. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So anybody that says Satan, somehow, you know, the Milton Bradley idea of uh, cartoons, that it's Satan down in, in hell, and he's running hell. No, 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 no. This is the last place Satan, the Antichrist, want to be. It's eternal judgment there. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. This is a pretty gory detail. That's the battle of Armageddon. It is, yes, it's a military, but it is a spiritual war. It's going to be devastating, and it's going to be overwhelmingly prevailing by Jesus Christ. And what does that end? The image. There's an image. What image? The image that the, the, that the Antichrist and false prophets set up. And what do you think that we run into in the book of Daniel chapter 3? Nebuchadnezzar and his image. Just fall down and worship the image and all, all will be well. And our remnant says, nope, we don't think so there, Nebuchadnezzar. You can send the symphony orchestra home. Uh, we're not going to bow down. Right? And you remember the contest. <laughs> you think your God's going to save you from this fiery furnace. You've got one a coming. And uh, you remember that Azariah uh, Mishael and what? Nope. He wasn't in on this one. Mishael. They said, O oh, king, we'll straighten you out on this one. Our God is able to deliver. Now, whether he decides to today or not, that's up to him. Did God deliver him from the fiery furnace? Trick question. Now, if you read the account properly, he did not. They went into the fiery furnace. A bunch of guys died putting them in there. He did not deliver them from the fiery furnace, but used that same fiery furnace to prevail against Nebuchadnezzar in his word. Mm -hmm. I looked and I looked for the three and I saw four. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. Now, look, they aren't supposed to multiply when you put them in there. That's for sure right? When they came out, they were untouched as if they'd never been in there in the first place, right? Okay, so this battle of Armageddon, that's what it is, and you see why it's there. What is, what is, what is Jesus Christ going to use? The sharp sword out of his mouth and a rod, what? Of iron. That rod always speaks of the power of God, Remember Moses and Aaron's rod, right? That was the power. And when God, uh, God uh, told Moses, raise that rod, and what happened? The Red Sea came together and Pharaoh's chariots were gone, mm -hmm. right? Uh, this is the rod of iron. That's the same rod of iron you see throughout the Old Testament, especially in the book of Psalms chapter 2. So let's understand um, this rod of iron. Armageddon, the name itself, um, it is an ancient hill and valley of Megiddo. So when you read about Megiddo. Um, it's the west of the Jordan and the plain of Jezreel between Samaria and Galilee. Isn't that an interesting place? Our Lord's ministry began and ended in Galilee, didn't it? Um, and um, Samaria, what was Samaria, you remember? Place of idolatry, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And you remember that terrible, bitter 
uh, vicious, malicious divisiveness between Samaria and Jerusalem. Uh, it is the appointed place where the armies of the beast false prophet will be destroyed by Jesus Christ, descending to earth in his glory, as well as any other forces with which may come against uh, him, the beast, in their attack on Palestine. Okay, so this is the smiting stone that Daniel 2.35 talks about. Okay, it's an interesting um, idea. We have the smitten shepherd in the first advent, and we have the smiting stone in the second advent. <laughs> right? The smitten shepherd is the smiting stone. Mm -hmm. Those nations that, that smote our Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to come back and destroy them. He's going to bring his kingdom in. In his first advent, his, the king and the kingdom were rejected. In the second advent, the kingdoms of this world are destroyed by his coming. Okay? All right. So I think we can appreciate that today. Armageddon, Valley of Megiddo. Uh, what has that got to do with? Well, it's very important to us in Scripture to um, to appreciate that, and I just want to spend just a minute um, uh, explaining that. Um, it's a strongly fortified elevation on the northern side of the great plains of Jezreel, was one of a chain of cities that remained unconquered during the period of the Judges. Uh, if you look in the book of Judges chapter 1, verse 27... Judges 1, 27. Neither did Massa drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and its towns, nor Taanach and its towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and its towns, nor the inhabitants of Ebliam and its towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and its towns, but the, Ca but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Um, it was uh, really the starting point of Joshua uh, in Joshua 17, 11, if you go back there. Yes, it goes all the way back here. Joshua chapter 17 uh, and in verse 11. Uh, and Manasseh had in Iskar and in Asher and Beth Shean and its towns and Eblim and its towns and the inhabitants of Dor, its towns and the inhabitants of Endor. Remember that's later were solvent, and its towns, and the inhabitants of Tanakh, and its towns, and the inhabitants of Megiddo, and its towns, even three countries. And yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of these cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. So it, it, it was a uh, very difficult strategical location. Um, the, the famous battle between the Syrian states and Egyptians under Tutmose III took place at Megiddo. Um, and Megiddo commanded the pass between the plains of Jezreel and Sharon, and for this reason was the scene of several battles recorded in Scripture. I'm not going to go through all those. Um, one is Deborah's victory uh, in, in Judges 4, uh, no one would take the armies of the Lord and lead them, so it ended up being Deborah. <laughs> mm -hmm. They all had a reason not to sign on. Mm -hmm. uh, and notice in verse 24 of chapter 4, Blessed above women all Jael, the wife of Hebar, the Canite, be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. He asked water, and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in the lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer she smote Sisera and smote off his head when he had pierced and stricken through his temples. And her feet he bowed, he fell. He lay down at her feet, he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down dead. The mother of Sisera looked out through a window and cried through the lattice, Why is this chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariot? Well, he's not coming back. 
uh, Deborah off these guys, and um, it's an interesting story. Uh, but nonetheless, um, it was uh, Gideon's victory was in Jezreel. Gideon's victory, his, his successful failure. Um, uh, it was Saul's defeat. He died on the plain of Jezreel. Um, and uh, the one that breaks my heart is uh, Josiah. He would die in that plain. He shouldn't have been there in the first place. Uh, God told him not to go to that battle, and he went anyway. And boy, what a great mistake that was. After all the good that Joshua had done, revival he brought in, he ends up in that battle and dying in it. And it's, it, you just have to look and say, well, that was stupid. <laughs> uh, and uh, he got into that for all the wrong reasons. So it will be the last battle of this age, and it'll be fought in Arm Armageddon, uh, as it's called now. So you can see that through the history of Israel, uh, this strategical location and uh, what it would mean um, in that era of time, this will be the final stage. This will be the final stage. Uh, let's look in the book of Joel for just a moment. The book of Joel, and it's important for us to follow these things all the way through. It's not some accident. Uh, you know, and we don't just take a piece of scripture. Uh, I know that, uh, that Hollywood's pretty good at that. And, of course, their interpretation is, well, it's Hollywood. It's not inspired scripture. But look in the book of Joel, chapter 3, and in verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare, the, prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say I'm strong. You know, that's... Um, taken also in another place, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Isn't it Isaiah? And isn't that what's on the... Um, now what's that place called? I want to say NATO. UN. That's the placard on the UN building. They shall beat their plowshares. In, right? Little do they know what that actually means. I don't think they'd have it on there. <laughs> Right, that's where the nations are going to come together, and God's going to wipe them out. <laughs> but anyway, it's it, that's interesting. Uh, notice, assemble yourselves and come ye all, come all ye nations, and gather yourselves together round about. There cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the nations be awakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's where Josiah linked up with Jehoshaphat. Why he ever did that, and Jehoshaphat ends up the one being killed in that battle. For there will I sit to judge all the nations round about, put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get down, for the press is full and the vats overflow, for, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. That's an interesting uh, description, isn't it? Uh, and the sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withhold, withdraw their light shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion. Zion always means grace. And utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and earth will shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. God's going to come, and he's going to defend um, Jerusalem. Look in Zechariah if you will, please. Book of Zechariah. I want to go forward a couple. Book of Zechariah. All right. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. This is one of the reasons we're reading Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12. You have a lot of, of a fourth telling about, and, and Zechariah about these events that's going to happen at the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And look in uh, chapter 12, the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, who stretcheth forth the heavens 
and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. That's a good passage for God maintaining. Uh, the breath, our very breath is held in his what? Hand. Who was that told to? By Daniel. You remember? Grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Belshazzar, remember? Uh, God in whose breath is in, is in his hand. <laughs> your, your kingdom's coming to an end tonight. You're, you're put in and found wanting. Okay? Now, notice, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the peoples round about when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. They're going to besiege Jerusalem again. It's an interesting place, the city of peace, but it is the most volatile place in the earth. Uh, and in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all peoples. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Through all the nations of the earth be gathered together against it. Yes, even America. Mm -hmm. I notice, in that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with terror and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah, and I will smite every horse. People. Notice this word smite. It's the smiting stone. This second advent is going to be the, almost the reverse of the first advent. The purpose of, the, of that advent was to what? Propagate the kingdom. Right? And to fulfill the cross of Christ. Can't get into the kingdom, but through the cross. Now notice, and the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in, in the Lord of hosts, their God. In that day, will I, will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheaf. And they shall devour all the peoples round about on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. A notice, and the Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, the glory of the house of David, the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Do not magnify themselves against Judah. Jerusalem, Ju that's Judah, Israel is going to be made one. The tribal lines will be reestablished. And notice, and in that day, what day? This day of judgment specifically. Um, in that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy what? All the nations that come against Jerusalem. All the nations that come against Jerusalem. Okay. And I will pour out upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Uh, let him be crucified. Where else is this statement made? Revelation, Revelation 1. Both Israel and the nations will look upon him whom they've pierced. Mm -hmm. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one in bitterness of his firstborn. That's specifically who? Israel here. Mm -hmm. Okay? In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of hadad Arimon in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, their wives apart, and so forth. Okay, they're going to look upon him whom they, oh boy. Once again, we get nowhere. Okay, we'll have to look at this. I wanted to get to chapter 14 where our Lord touches his feet down on um, Zion, uh, down in, in the... Um, that um, uh, let's look at it a second, just real quick. I know I'm over. I'm sorry. Um, in verse four, fourteen, four, 
Notice, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the mount of what? Olives. That's where our Lord prayed in his first uh, advent, you remember. The Mount of Olives. And so, yes. So we, we see when he comes this time, he's coming to destroy the kingdom and to establish his own. All right, we'll look at this, this ending of the Gentile world power and also the destruction of Babylon the Great. And that's what this ending of this image, the destruction of this image of the Gentile world power. Then we'll begin to move forward, uh, Daniel 2 and 7. Okay, last, last, last song. I'm sorry, page 489. 